So the key is time is precious. Now let me give you Bill Bailey's description of time. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences, their frequency and their intensity. Life is not just watching the clock tick away. Life is a collection of experiences, their intensity, their frequency. Whatever the span of your life turns out to be, here's what you want to fill it up with, experiences and the intensity of those experiences. But now let's talk about the management of time. When should you start the day? As soon as you have it finished. Plan the day the best you can, leaving plenty of room for improvising and surprises and all the stuff that happens during the course of the day. But if you've planned a good productive day, now you start that day, you can't believe how much more valuable your time will be. Don't start the day until you have it finished. Now here's the next one. Don't start the week until you've had it finished. Now to lay out a week is a pretty good challenge. Next, don't start the month until you have it finished. The places to go and the people to see and the productivity and the sales and the customers and the development and all the rest of what you want to accomplish during the course of 30 days. Don't start the month till it's finished. And then here's the big one. This is really challenging. Don't start the year until you have it finished. To the best of your ability, it can't be finished like minute by minute. But in terms of the sweep of what you want to accomplish, make sure that that's set and ready to go by the time January 1st rolls around. Now, jot this down. Approaches to the management of time. Here's the first one. Ignore the subject. I mean, that's good advice. Don't let anything overly bug you. Because remember now, you don't have to do anything. Someone says, well, I got to get a handle on my time. And the answer is, no, you don't. If you want to let it all go, you can let it all go. I mean, this is good advice. Somebody says, you ought, you ought, you ought. Jot this down. Ignore all the you oughts or you should. Only if they're giving general information. We should. It's better to say if you're teaching, we should. Not you should. We should. Then you let me listen in without it being too confrontational. If everyone did this, see, that'd be great. And then you give a person a chance to choose to do it or not to do it. But when you start the you ought, you ought, now see if I don't, now see we've got some tension and maybe some problems. So you ought seem to always create problems. When you're talking to your kids, you say, no, if kids would do this, not always saying if you did this, if you did this, life would be better. But if kids did this, life would be better. It's like making a little talk and letting them listen in. And then it's a little less confrontational. It gives us a choice. In one of my seminars, here's what I teach. All life form strives to the max of its potential except human beings. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it possibly can. You never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, trees don't grow half. A tree drives its roots as deep as it can, reaches as high as it can, produces every leaf it can, every fruit it possibly can. To the max, every life form strives to the max, except human beings. Now, why not human beings? Jot this down. You've been given the dignity of choice. You're not a robot. You don't have to repeat this year the same as last year. You can tear up last year's plan, develop a new plan. So the dignity of being a human being. Now, here's the choice on being a human being. To be part of all we were meant to be or to be all. To strive for all, or half, or part, or some. The choice is up to you to develop one skill or ten skills. Someone says, well, I'd be happy with just one more language. Well, some say, hey, I'm going to learn six or seven. And this is all a matter of choice. And when someone says, no, you ought to learn four, you've got to resist all that. Because this is personal dignity. And you don't want to destroy someone's dignity by by doing all the oughts and they feel reluctant to do it, now we've got problems. So if you want to, just ignore this subject on time management. Now here's the next one. Step down to something easier. The guy's in sales and he says, oh, I want to own the company. Finally owns the company. Now he's got no time to play golf. He said, when I was in sales, I was making big money playing golf three days a week. Heck with this owning something. Heck with managing. My life was never my own after I started to manage. I'm going back to sales. See, this is the key. 
If you're getting too pressed, you might consider stepping down to something with a little easier time pressure. Next key to time management. And that's work longer and harder. But see, there's a limit to that. I almost lost my health the first year. I went so crazy about personal development and achievement. I just went bonkers. You know, I told you I was skinny. By the end of that first year, I was a walking shadow. And then it suddenly occurred to me, what if I got rich and too ill to spend it? I mean, that was a shocker. So I started, you know, developing a little more reasonable because I said, if 12 hours won't do it, I'll work 14. If that won't do it, I'll work 18. I mean, how many hours it takes. And sure enough, it, it cost me too much. So see, working longer and harder for some might be appropriate. You know, if you're just sitting around not doing that much, this might be good, work longer and harder. But you can only work so hard. Here's the key, not to work harder, but smarter. When you've worked as hard as you can, doing the best you can in terms of physical output in the time, reasonable time. Now here's the ultimate in the management of time, and that is you simply become more skillful. When I first got into sales, you know, I was around people that could get, you know, nine out of 10, eight out of 10. And when I first started, I could only get one out of 10. But here's what I did. I worked around the clock, around the clock, so that I would make up in numbers what I lacked in skill. That's good in sales. You got to jot that down. When you're new, you make up in numbers what you lack in skill. Now, when you become more skillful, the numbers can go down because now your persuasive ability and all of that is now so high that you don't need to put as many numbers out. But at first, if you want to compete or if you want to really get good, you've got to put in the numbers. But if you get more from yourself, develop more of yourself, now the time management becomes an easier task. Now here's the next thing. Either you run the project or it runs you. I've found out when you start something, at first you're in charge. All of a sudden, a year later, it's in charge. Some of the companies I started, I'm telling you, I'm in control. A couple of years later, I'm out of control. At first, I've got it on the run. Two years later, it's got me on the run. Haven't got enough time. I'm dizzy with trying to get it all done. So here's part of the key, and that's to get in charge. Say, I'm going to take charge of my health. Take charge of your time. Take charge of your resources, which we're going to talk about next. You're the one that's responsible for it. It's not a requirement of society that you not have a heart attack and take care of your family. That's not a requirement of society, but you must make it a requirement of yourself. Society doesn't require that you build a financial wall around your family. Nothing can get through. That's not a requirement of society. It's a requirement you impose on yourself to build a financial wall around your family. Nothing can get through. So impose on yourself this self-development of being in charge taking charge of your life and your health and your future and your responsibilities and all the rest. Next, reasonable time is enough time to achieve all of your goals. Just jot that down. Reasonable time is enough time. I had to learn that. Reasonable time is enough time. Here's why. It's not the hours you put in. It's what you put in the hours. If you start depositing greater ideas into the hours you've got later than now, I'm telling you later, you can't believe the productivity that will flow. The ideas you can't think of now, a year from now, they'll start to flow. And when you deposit those ideas in the hours you've got, productivity multiplies by two, three, five, ten. Next, time management essential. We've already covered the first one, a written set of goals. And then do priorities on your goals. What's important this week? What's important this month? Here's the next one. Often review. Just go over your goals to make sure that your list is working for you. It's got you inspired. It's got you turned on. Somebody says, how come you're up so early? Say, if you were headed where I'm headed, you'd be up early too. If you were going to meet who I'm going to meet, you'd be up early. If it was going to stack up for you like it's stacking up for me, you'd be getting up early. Here's some more time management essentials. Learn to study what we call majors and minors. You pick up the phone. Here's what you must say when you pick up the phone. Is this a major conversation or a minor conversation? If it's minor, a few pleasantries and you're done. If it's major, maybe you've got to make a few notes. So here's the next one. Important conversations make an agenda before you make the call. 
just jot down a little agenda. It's so easy now to just talk out of your head. Did you ever hear a conversation end like this? Like this. Let's see, there was something else. See, you don't look that swift. I can't think of it right now. I'll call you back. See, you look a little incompetent. Let's see, there was something. It escapes me right now. Really? So have you got this now? Make an agenda before you make a call if it's an important call. Now, later, that saves you all kinds of stuff. So what's major, what's minor? Now, here's the key on this. Don't major in minor things. If you take up major time to do minor things, I'm telling you, you'll be behind the curve constantly. Here's what we learn in sales training. What's major time and what's minor time? And if you took a look, if you're in sales and you took a look at a week, you'd say, my gosh, I'm spending 90% of my time on the minor stuff and so little time on the major stuff in the presence of. How many hours in the presence of in my day? How many hours in the presence of during my sales week? Because the time that really counts is in the presence of majors and minors. Here's another key time management essential. Don't mistake movement for achievement. It's easy to get faked out by being busy. Guy comes home at night all exhausted, falls in the chair and says, oh, I've been going, going, going. Here's the big question. Doing what? It's not the going, going, going. Some people are going, 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 and they're doing figure eights. Progress is small. So don't mistake movement for achievement. Now, here's a big one, concentration. I had to learn this. All those years ago, I'm in the shower trying to compose a letter. Found It turns out to be a strange letter. So here's what I learned to do. Save the work till you get to the office. Save the work till you get to the work. Don't try to get to the office on the way to work. On the way to work, enjoy the way. In the shower, enjoy the shower. Then go to work when you get to work. I found this to be helpful. Concentration. Here's another big one. Learn to say no. I'm telling you, in such a social society we have now, it's so easy to try to be a nice person saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Find yourself overloaded. Now you've got to call and make the, well, gosh, you know, all the time it takes to back out of something that you said, said yes to too quickly. Here's what might be better. I don't think so, but if that changes, I'll call you. Little things you can use not to commit, overcommit yourself. My friend Ron Reynolds says, don't let your mouth overload your back. It's a good one. Now, here's a big one on time management. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. I used to take my family to the beach and I would bring my briefcase. I learned not to do that. Or at the beach, I'm saying I should be at the office. I should be at the office. Now my family's upset because I'm at the beach and I'm thinking office, office, office. Now, when I'm at the office, I'm thinking what? I got to get my family to the beach, the beach, the beach. So things are not going too well at the office because I'm thinking beach and things are not going too well at the beach because I'm thinking office. Here's what I learned to do. At the beach, be at the beach. At the office, be at the office. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. Now, here's one of the most important ones. Don't play at work. Work is too serious. But I'm telling you, you've got to be serious about work because you're parting with a piece of your life for the work you do. Your work costs you a piece of your life. Here's what it's called serious business not grim not unhappy but serious here's another key phrase all work is good you may not like your job but if it's the stepping stones to get you to where you want to to go you got to appreciate your job you don't have to have a passion for your job here's the ultimate passion a passion for incredible success in every department of my life that's the passion but don't look down on some menial job you have to do to finally get you to where you want to go. No job is menial, menial. No job is not, no, every job is noble. Training life for pay, making a contribution to society. Next, analyze how you are. And if you have some weaknesses, if you can't, doesn't seem like you can change, here's the key, get it covered. I used to keep promising myself I'd keep the books, keep the books, keep the books. Finally, I gave that up. And back then, it only took me an extra 50, 60 bucks a month for some accountant to keep the books. I said, no, I'm going to save the 50 bucks. You can't believe what I started losing in productivity because I tried to save the 50 bucks. So the key is a lot of the time you can stay like you are, but just make sure you get it covered. Next. Beware of the telephone and all other systems of communication. 
especially the telephone at home and systems of communication at home. And here's one of the best lines I've got for you for the weekend. Let all communication systems serve you, but don't let them intrude. Here's the next one. Read all the books. You know, I've only got a few notes here on time management. But if you've got some particular challenges, you run a big organization, a big corporation, you've got some challenges, there's plenty of books. Now, here's what's next. Just be more alert to the things that might be stealing your time. Here's why. Time is like capital. You can't let someone steal your seed corn. You can't let someone steal your capital. And you can't let someone steal your time. You must designate your time. And some of the time that you designate, you must not let anyone steal. Casual time, you might let someone intrude and steal a little bit and take a little bit, but not serious time. Next, one of the great time management savers is to learn to ask questions up front. Sometimes you talk to somebody for an hour, and then you ask questions and find out if you would have asked those questions up front, you could have saved yourself an hour. Asking questions up front helps you to get to the problem now. But if you just launch into some discourse, you might waste 30 minutes, waste an hour, when here's what you should have been talking about. After you've finished an hour, you say, John, what's really the problem? He said, well, it's something personal. See, that's what you should have been talking about this whole hour. Now, here's the last one, thinking on paper, and that's to keep a journal. One of the things I'm known for around the world, have been now for 39, 40 years, is keeping a journal. Now, my journal is not a, you know, it's not necessarily a, it's not like a diary. It might be part diary. You know, I'm flying over Ireland and I, I write down a few little things that impress me. Uh, today I met this person. Wow, what an extraordinary event. Uh, today this, I conducted this seminar in Rome. A thousand people stood up and sang for me. I've got a little bit of a diary in there. But here's what primarily your journal is for. Collecting good ideas. A journal is to collect good ideas on your health, good ideas for your business, good ideas for your future, good ideas for time management. Because I used to take notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes and restaurant placemats. And I threw all this stuff in a drawer. It did not serve me well. I finally learned to get a bound copy, right? And just keep a journal, right? If I was here, I had my journal, I'd be taking notes, right? These two days in my journal. Now, if you're caught without your journal, you just take the notes when you get back home, put those notes in your journal, throw the paper away. Because we don't usually go through paper to review. But see, my journals now make up a significant part of my own library. Here's what's next to leave behind, and that's your library. The books that changed your life, the books that changed your health, the books that rescued you from oblivion, the books that you passed on to other people, they were so exciting for you, the books that made you financially independent, the books that developed your leadership, the books that gave you wisdom to ponder when things were tough. The books that got you through the winter. The books that helped you to plant in the spring and harvest in the fall. What a treasure to leave behind. If you do that, here's what's for sure. Your books will be more valuable than your furniture. So to answer the question of where you want to arrive and the kind of person you want to be, you've got to get serious. What I would ask you to do, starting today, is get excited about committing an act. An act that's positive, an act that's constructive to make the changes in your life that you want made and to go the direction that you want to go. Get excited about your potential. Human capacity is usually never the problem. Little children can learn several languages. We can learn to do the most incredible things. All we need to do is take the time to do it. So it's not a matter of capacity. It's a matter of judgment, it's a matter of excitement, it's a matter of will, and it's a matter of wanting too bad enough. So it's pretty exciting to know that any day you wish, you can change your life. Any day you pick out, you can make major changes. It doesn't ever have to be the same again. And that's exciting. Knowing that intellectually and personally, you can actually do the things that will make major changes in your life. There's so many things to work on on this, that if you don't get busy and work on it, sure enough, the time will pass. And sure enough, five years from now, you'll wind up where you don't want to be, wearing what you don't want to wear, driving what you don't want to drive, being what you don't want to be. Now's the time to fix it. Now here's number three. You've got to get going. 
All of the things that you've learned will not do you that much good if you don't put it into an action plan. You've got to get going. In my management and leadership seminar, we teach game plans, how to put all the good things that you've learned into action. Economic action, social action, personal action. How to make the changes and how to actually do the work, how to actually function. Get going, that's the key. Some people are ever learning, but they don't put it into action. They don't really take the action. It's like the man who keeps bringing materials to the building site and never builds anything. He keeps bringing in the sand and the gravel and the windows and the doors and the roofing material, and he just stacks up all these supplies, but he never builds anything. See, if you do that long enough, fairly soon they'll come and take you away. You've got to do something with what you've learned. You've got to take action. You've got to get going. So that's one of the most important things to learn, how to design your days, how to design your weeks, how to design the months so that you take the proper action to get the proper return that you're looking for, whether it's economic or personal. Get going. It's a major key. Now let me show you what triggers all emotions into activity that brings results. And results is the name of the game. Here it is. Action. Finally, you must do something about how you feel. Jesus, the master teacher said, don't just be listeners, be doers. The world admires the doers. Whatever it takes to get you to try harder, read more, set your goals and go for it. Here's the next attitude disease, over caution. Some people never will have much. They're too cautious. Now you can also be too reckless, but you can also be too cautious. This is called the timid approach to life. And my caution was always the risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. I used to say, what if this happens? It's called the language of the poor. What if this happens? And on top of that, if this was to happen, look at the fix I'd be in. I better not try. I could always ace myself out. Then I'll tell you what changed my whole life when I finally discovered it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. If you think trying is risky, wait till they hand you the bill for not trying. If you think investing is risky, wait till you get the tab for not investing. See, it's all risky. Getting married is risky. Having children is risky. Going into business is risky. Investing your money is risky. It's all risky. I'll tell you how risky life is. You're not gonna get out alive. <laughs> That's risky. The Englishman says, well, if that's the way it's going to work out, let's give it a go. Right. That's what it's for. Give it a go. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine, then huddle in a corner. We'll cover you with a sheet, bring you three meals a day. And we'll protect you, feed you, look after you, care for you. We won't let anything happen to you. And you'll probably live to be 100. The guy said, well, yeah, I'd live to be 100. But what a way to live, right? What a way to live safe and secure. Don't ask for security, ask for adventure. Better to live 30 years full of adventure than 100 years safe in the corner. And see, it's not important how long you live. What's important is how you live. Here's the next attitude disease. We're almost through with this motley list. In fact, we're almost through. Hang on. The next one is pessimism. Pessimism, the deadly disease of always looking on the bad side, the problem side, the difficult side, checking all the reasons why it can't be done. The poor pessimist leads an ugly life. He doesn't try to figure out what's right. He tries to figure out what's wrong. He doesn't look for virtue. He looks for faults. And when he finds them, he's delighted. How ugly. This is the poor guy looks through the window, doesn't see the sunset. He sees the specks on the window. <laughs> 
And this is the poor guy, right, who rushes up, takes such leave of his senses. This guy rushes up and he says, I've got five good reasons why it won't work. He's so dumb, he doesn't know. All he needs one. He's got five. <laughs> to the pessimist, the glass is always half empty. To the optimist, the glass is half full. Why would the same measure affect people two different ways? Answer, it all depends on how you look at it. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are, not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. There's a subject we don't have time to get into tonight called better thinking habits. One of the major things Shove taught me when I met him he said, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And Shove taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, as you think, so you become. How awesome. When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. I'd even read the back pages. I seem to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that, and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. <laughs> you walk around on your financial knees. They call you economic peewee. <laughs> the guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library, number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because what a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory, and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. <laughs> Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. <laughs> you might as well try making a cake with cement. The kids back in Danbury, Connecticut, high school, they're asking me questions one day. I'm talking to the kids. Kids got good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, how do you build the good life? I said, it's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Here's how you build anything. Select the right ingredients, keep out the wrong ingredients, and it starts with thought. Everything starts with thought. So you must be wise and careful what you think about because that starts everything. You got to be wise and careful. I asked the kids, what would happen if somebody dropped sugar in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be okay. I said, what if somebody dropped strychnine in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson one, life is both sugar and strychnine. You gotta be careful. I said, what if my worst enemy drops in the sugar? They said, will you be okay? I said, what if my best friend, even by accident, drops in the strychnine? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson two, watch your coffee. <laughs> You got to be careful. See, it doesn't matter who hands you the bad stuff. It doesn't matter where you get the bad stuff. It'll still do its damage on your bank account. 
wherever you get it. Mr. Schoff gave me one of the greatest phrases when I first met him when he said, Jim, every day stand guard at the door of your mind. How important. Stand guard at the door of your mind. And you decide what goes into your mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory because you've got to live with the results. Okay, here's the last disease and we're through with this list. In fact, we're almost through, hang on. The last subject is very brief. The last disease, but this one is deadly. Engage in this one, indulge in it even slightly and you might as well forget the future because it's gonna forget you. Complaining, crying, whining, griping, a Bible word called murmuring. See, that'll ace your future. Spend five minutes complaining and you have wasted five. And you may have begun what's known as economic cancer of the bone. Surely they will soon haul you off into a financial desert and there let you choke on the dust of your own regret. I hope I said that well, so you won't forget. It's a deadly disease. If you don't think it's bad, ask the children of Israel of Old Testament fame. Typical of us all, their story just happened to get in the book. Story says, children of Israel were slaves. God performed a series of dazzling miracles and got them out. And now they're heading for the promised land. Remember the story? Heading for the promised land. Tragedy of the story? tienen que hacer es no desatender la forma, fijarse estas disciplinas paso a paso. No permitan que nadie se las quite. Sigan de cerca los números y ustedes podrán alejarse de las sombras y entrar en la luz. Dejar que sus vidas se vuelvan poderosas y valiosas y únicas y que tengan todos los patrimonios que puedan manejar en sus vidas, tanto ustedes como sus familias y sus tesoros y sus emprendimientos. Y eso es lo que les deseo a todos ustedes. Bueno, mi último comentario para terminar. Si me lo permiten, les diré unas palabras personales. Pidan la ayuda de Dios. Es una cuestión personal. No les pido que crean en mi filosofía. Pero a todos nos viene bien recibir algo de ayuda, creo. Pero claro, uno tiene que hacer su parte. De eso se trata realmente esta sociedad. Y es sobre eso que hablé día a día en este seminario cumpliendo con su parte y mi parte. Recuerden la historia sobre el hombre que tomó una pila de rocas y en un par de años la convirtió en un hermoso jardín. Y algunos años después, un hombre recorrió el jardín y pensó que era fabuloso, pero quiso asegurarse de que el jardinero no recibiera todo el crédito. Así que cuando tuvo la oportunidad de conocerlo, después de la recorrida, le dio la mano y dijo, «Señor jardinero, usted y el buen Dios tienen aquí un hermoso jardín». Directo para señalar su punto El jardinero contestó Hey, entiendo su punto Si no fuera por las semillas y el suelo Y el milagro de las estaciones y el sol y la lluvia Dijo Seguramente aquí no habría ningún jardín Pero agregó ¿Sabe? Usted debería haber visto este lugar hace algunos años Cuando Dios se ocupaba de todo solo Me gusta esa parte Y el motivo es que tenemos que desempeñar nuestra parte Para ayudar a que se cumplan nuestros propios milagros y espero que todo lo que hoy compartí con ustedes les haya dado una comprensión un poco mejor sobre cómo realizar esos milagros en sus vidas. Adiós. Que Dios los bendiga. Gracias por haber venido hoy. Gracias por haber escuchado El Desafío de Tener Éxito de Jim Rohn. Existe una historia de la Biblia que enseña la ley de los promedios. Es una historia interesante llamada la parábola del sembrador. La historia del sembrador. Y si no la leyeron últimamente, se trata de una historia muy, muy interesante de leer. Es un estupendo ejemplo de la ley de los promedios. Esta parábola del sembrador. El sembrador, antiguamente, era el tipo que plantaba los cultivos. Lo llamaban sembrador, sí. Todos preparaban el terreno. No sé cómo hacían para prepararlo, ¿sí? Pero todos preparaban el terreno. Y este tipo, al que llamaban el sembrador, plantaba los cultivos y usaba una enorme bolsa con semillas. Caminaba por el campo y... 
Sí, sembraba las semillas y plantaba los cultivos. Lo llamaban sembrador. Ahora, la historia del sembrador es una típica historia de vida y de personas y de resultados y de lo que uno puede esperar. ¿Sí? Y uno tiene que dejar que lo obvio se convierta en su mejor maestro. Cuando uno lee la historia del sembrador, se encuentra algunos puntos muy, muy interesantes. Primero, el sembrador era un hombre sabio. Y cuando uno lee la historia completa, llega a la conclusión de que el sembrador era un hombre sabio. Y esto es una gran ventaja. Uno no quiere enviar a un tonto a plantar la cosecha, ¿sí? Pasaríamos hambre en otoño. El siguiente punto en la historia es que el sembrador tenía semillas excelentes. ¡Excelentes! La historia dice que él era el mejor. No se conformaba con algo barato y de segunda calidad. El tercer punto en la historia es que era sumamente ambicioso. Y cuando uno lee la historia completa, llega a la conclusión de que este hombre era ambicioso, que es una cualidad admirable. ¡Ambición! Y luego fue a trabajar. El tipo dice, «Ah, sabía que en algún lugar habría una complicación». Seguramente ahí es donde esté, ¿verdad? El tipo va a trabajar. La historia habla de este sembrador con excelentes semillas, sumamente ambicioso, con oportunidades que lo rodeaban por donde mirase, tenía la capacidad, tenía las semillas, todo estaba preparado, y comienza a sembrar para tener algunos resultados. Lo que es interesante en la historia es lo que le pasó. Es una típica historia de vida, pero es fascinante. La historia dice esto. El hombre comienza a sembrar las semillas temprano por la mañana, pero la primera parte de las semillas que siembra cae al borde del camino y los pájaros se las comen. Él siembra estas buenas semillas, un hombre sumamente ambicioso que siembra estas buenas semillas y los pájaros se las quitan. Siembra algunas más y los pájaros las comen. Siembra algunas más y los pájaros las comen. Pero recuerden que esta es una historia de vida y de personas. ¿Les parece que esto sea algo típico? Vean, yo tengo que decirles como líder que los pájaros van a comerse parte de las semillas. ¡Prepárate, John! Digamos que están en el negocio de los bienes inmobiliarios, ¿sí? Alguien aquí está en el negocio de los bienes inmobiliarios. ¡Prepárate, John! John dice, ¡Hey! Estoy buscando un cambio. Necesito un cambio de ocupación y escuché sobre los bienes inmobiliarios. Ustedes dirán, John, ven conmigo el viernes por la noche. Vamos a realizar una clase orientativa y te mostraremos cómo funciona. Podría ser un rayo de luz para ti. Ganarías el dinero que quieres ganar. Darías un giro a tu vida. ¿Quién sabe lo que puede pasar? John dirá, me parece estupendo. Allí estaré el viernes por la noche. Aprenderé todo. Seguramente me convierte en uno de sus mejores vendedores. Dirán, bueno, nos vemos el viernes por la noche. Llega la noche del viernes. Se suponía que comenzarían a las 7.30 y John no aparece. Hmm. Uno dirá, bueno, quizás hay mucho tránsito. Así que esperamos hasta las 8. Cerca de las 8 llegamos a una conclusión. No va a venir. Pregunta, ¿qué pasó desde la inigualable conversación que tuvieron con John y le dieron esa estupenda idea, prepararon una explicación, le ayudarían a cambiar su vida, él dijo que estaría allí y sin embargo no está allí? ¿Qué podría haber pasado entre ese momento y el viernes por la noche? Los pájaros alcanzaron al chico. Lo atraparon. Y quién sabe quién podría haber sido, ¿cierto? Tal vez fuera su cuñado. Le habrá dicho, bienes inmobiliarios, no vas a meterte en esas cosas, ¿no? Lo habrá convencido de no hacerlo. O su plomero le habrá dicho, deje que le hable sobre los bienes inmobiliarios. ¡Su plomero! Bueno, si rastrean el mensaje hasta lo que pasó, podrían perder el camino. Existen un par de cosas que se pueden hacer cuando los pájaros están comiendo las semillas. Uno es que no se puede perseguir a los pájaros. Maldecirán a esos condenados pájaros e irán a perseguirlos. Dirán, esperen a que vea a su cuñado. Voy a ponerle los puntos sobre las IES. ¿Qué sabe él sobre bienes inmobiliarios? ¡Y su plomero! Entonces estarán tratando de corregir las cosas en lugar de aceptarlas como son. La mejor lección en la vida es aceptar como es y no desear que fuera de otra manera. No desear corregirla. ¿Cómo aprovechar la manera en que es? Algunas personas prefieren vengarse a seguir adelante. Se desvían de su camino. Verán, si están persiguiendo pájaros, tendrán que abandonar el campo. Ya no estarán sembrando. Y sus posibilidades disminuirán en lugar de aumentar. Hay cosas que uno no trata de solucionar. Hay cosas que se deben ignorar. 
La historia dice que este sabio sembrador hizo lo siguiente. Dice que ignoró a los pájaros y siguió sembrando. ¡Muy listo! Hay cosas que uno tiene que aceptar. Así son las cosas. Así que siguió sembrando. Y la clave es que si uno sigue sembrando, podrá sembrar más de lo que los pájaros puedan comer. Pero los pájaros son parte de la vida. Y no me pregunten por qué. Yo no soy el que lo dispuso. Yo no sé. Simplemente así son las cosas. Así que siguió sembrando. Bueno, la historia dice que el sembrador siguió sembrando. Y las semillas cayeron en terreno poco profundo. Terreno rocoso, donde no podían entrar. Y dice que esta vez las plantitas comenzaron a crecer. Los pájaros no las comieron. Pero el primer día de calor, estas plantitas se marchitaron y murieron. ¡Qué desilusión, ¿no? Pero eso seguramente pase. Esta vez, uno está reclutando a John. John dice, seré uno de sus mejores empleados. Él no se presenta a la tercera reunión. Dirán, ¿dónde está John? Dirán, yo no sé, alguien lo asustó y él... Cuando yo iba al colegio, había algo más de 400 personas. No, sí, había algo más de 400 personas en primer año y 150 en el último año. ¿Eso es inusual? Verán, siempre hay más personas en los primeros años que en los siguientes. ¿Cómo se llama eso? La ley de los promedios. La vida se cobra una cuota inevitable. Todos deberían quedarse hasta el final, ¿verdad? Tal vez deberían, pero no lo hacen. Y hay que aprender a tomarse eso con calma. Si no, perderán el camino. Se tropezarán, se frustrarán, confundirán su comprensión de la vida y no sabrán lo que pasa. Hay que entender que a veces las semillas caen en terreno poco profundo. Y no dice qué hay que hacer con el terreno poco profundo. Simplemente dice que así son las cosas. Y tenemos la tendencia a decir, el mes pasado creía que John era algo seguro. Pero lo seguro es lo que pasó. Seguramente estén desilusionados. Dejen que les cuente. Cuando esto no resulte, ya saben, tal como habían planeado, van a desilusionarse. Pero ahí está lo que uno debe aprender para ser un líder. Hay que aprender a controlar sus desilusiones. Es algo muy importante. Pero a veces es fácil decir, bueno, Pete renunció. John renunció. Supongo que voy a renunciar. Y estarán siguiendo a otros en lugar de liderar. Seguramente estén desilusionados. Pero bueno, estén desilusionados, pero no dejen que eso les gane. Y no dejen que eso se acumule sobre sus hombros. Simplemente comprendan que así son las cosas. Desearía que se hubiese quedado, pero le deseo lo mejor donde sea que vaya. No duró en el trabajo, pero ¿y eso qué? Así es la vida. Bueno... Esto es lo que la historia dice que hizo el sabio sembrador. Siguió sembrando. Muy listo. Y dice que las semillas cayeron en un terreno espinoso. El tipo dirá, bueno, ¿cuánta mala suerte se puede tener? Bien, aguarden. Todavía no es el final de la historia. Las semillas cayeron en el terreno espinoso y las plantitas comenzaron a crecer. Pero las espinas las asfixiaron hasta matarlas. ¿Les parece que esto sea algo típico? Verán, las espinas iban a hacer algo. La pequeña historia de la Biblia llamada espinas, las preocupaciones de la vida. Pequeñas preocupaciones, pequeñas obligaciones que engañan a las personas y les roban sus grandes oportunidades y que se presentan a diario. Y no sé qué hacer al respecto. Llamo a John y le digo, John, ¿dónde estuviste anoche? Teníamos una reunión. John responde, bueno, no puedo reunirme. Digo, ¿por qué no? John responde, bueno, tengo que hacer muchas otras cosas. Digo, ¿cuáles? No creerán la lista que me mencionó John de lo que tuvo que hacer anoche. La valla del patio se estaba cayendo y los perros iban a escaparse. No se puede dejar que los perros anden sueltos. El mosquitero se había salido de los goznes. No se puede dejar que las cosas se vengan abajo. Hay que tomarse el tiempo para repararlas. Había bastante basura apilada en el garaje y no se puede dejar que una montaña de basura ocupe tu casa. Hay que tomarse el tiempo para tirar todas esas cosas. Todo por teléfono. Y puedo escuchar cómo el teléfono comienza a hacer... ¡Ah! Las personas dejan que las pequeñeces las engañen y les roben sus grandes oportunidades. Algunas personas tienen la increíble habilidad de agrandar cosas menores. Fui con mi auto por esta pequeña comunidad. John estaba afuera, cortando el césped, maldiciendo las malezas, la cara roja y al punto de explotar. Me detuve y salí del auto y le dije, «John, ¿qué estás haciendo?» Me contestó, «¿Qué parece que estoy haciendo? Estoy cortando este maldito césped». Le dije, «John, 
Hay un montón de chicos en el vecindario que podrían cortar tu césped. Dijo, sí, pero quieren que les pague cinco dólares. Lo cortaré yo mismo, lo cortaré. Número uno, debería existir alguna ley para impedir que a los chicos del vecindario les roben cinco dólares. Esa sería toda una ley. Pero el peor robo es dejar que las pequeñeces le roben a uno sus oportunidades más importantes. Culpa de las espinas, de las preocupaciones. ¿Pero qué se puede hacer al respecto? Bien, yo solía dar clases sobre cómo no permitir que las espinas lleguen a las semillas. Pero no resultó. Es decir, esas clases no eran de ayuda. La historia dice que este hombre sabio hizo lo siguiente. Siguió sembrando. ¡Muy listo! Él comprendía la ley de los promedios. Seguir sembrando. La gente buena no se capacita para ser buena. Se encuentra. Uno no necesita mucha capacitación para la gente buena. Encuentren gente buena. Y la historia dice finalmente que las semillas cayeron en un buen terreno. Eso dice. Alguien dirá, ¿cómo se encuentra un buen terreno? La respuesta es cuando uno sigue buscando. Uno se dará cuenta cuando aparezca. Uno no tendrá que convertir algo malo en bueno. Uno se dará cuenta de que algo es bueno cuando aparezca. E incluso cuando el terreno es bueno. La historia dice que el terreno bueno produjo el 30%. Parte de él produjo el 60%. Y parte de él produjo el 100%. Incluso en terreno bueno. ¿Cómo se llama eso? La ley de los promedios, de las proporciones. ¿Dónde aplica? En todas partes. Y me que la mente es como una fábrica, una mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are. Not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, As you think, so you become. When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. I'd even read the back pages. I seemed to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. You walk around on your financial knees. Kids got good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, how do you build the good life? I said, it's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Here's how you build anything. Select the right ingredients, keep out the wrong ingredients, and it starts with thought. Everything starts with thought. So you must be wise and careful what you think about, because that starts everything. And you decide what goes into your mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory, because you've got to live with the results. The guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library, number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because What a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory, and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. Now, you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night. Although, if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here is all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Half rich isn't bad. 30 minutes. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key. Every day. Don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. How easy is it to get up in the morning when you know you're not doing all that it takes? It's not very easy at all. 
You can just lay there awake thinking, oh, what's a few more minutes in bed? It won't matter much anyway. Wrong. It does matter. It will matter. Now, how easy is it to get up in the morning when you're pouring it on, doing the best you can, anxious to get going, make progress toward your dreams? It's a whole different story. When you're resting to renew your reserves, it's much different than resting to avoid your day. When you're psyched up and excited for your life, when you're excited for what you've planned to accomplish for the day, it's amazing you'll wake up before the alarm clock even tries to startle you awake. Your successes fuel your ambition. Your successes give you extra energy. Your successes pave the way for more successes. It's the snowball effect. With one success, you're excited to meet another, and another, and another. And pretty soon, the disciplines that were so difficult in the beginning, the disciplines that got you going, are now part of your philosophy. How do you know when you're successful? Do you have to be a millionaire? No. All we ask of you is that you earn all you possibly can. If you earn 10,000 a year and that's the best you can do, that's enough. God and everything else will see to it that you're okay. The key is to just do the best you can. If it's 10,000 a year, wonderful. If it's 100,000 a year, wonderful. If it's a million a year, wonderful. It doesn't matter 10,000 a year or a million a year. It doesn't matter as long as you've done the best you possibly can. Earn the most you possibly can. Be the most you possibly can. And here's why. The essence of life is growth. The essence of life is growth, to do the best you can. We keep growing until we're done. Get around successful people and listen. Now, you can also learn from unsuccessful people. Take notes on both, negative and positive. On the negative, the notes are called what not to do. And you got to learn what not to do as well as what to do. So learn from the negative as well as the positive. Find out what poor people read and don't read it. But now you can also learn from the positive. Get around successful people. Listen to what they say. Listen to how they say it. It's important. We've all got about 16 waking hours. Practice listening, those 16 hours. And I say practice listening because listening isn't easy. I found out it's easier to talk than it is to listen. But if you will practice listening, the 16 hours you're awake, sure enough, from surprising sources comes great ideas. Now, here's some of the best advice I've got for the whole evening. It won't get any better than this. This is it. Poor people ought to take rich people out to dinner and listen. That's some of the best I got. If a guy's not doing well, one of the first things he ought to do is find a guy that is doing well and offer to buy him his dinner. Spend 50, 60, 80 hundred dollars. Go for the full nine course. Start him on the juices and hors d'oeuvres. Get him started talking. The salad takes 15 minutes. Keep it rolling. Biggest steak in town takes 45. Keep it rolling. Pour on the dessert. Stretch that meal out about two hours. If you get a successful person to eat and talk for two hours, they're liable to drop ideas in your lap, change your life. Multiply your income by two, by three, by five. But you're right. Poor people don't usually take rich people out to dinner. That's the problem. The guy said he's rich, let him buy his own dinner. I'm not coming up with any money. The words we have are the only words available to us. The words we know are the only tools available to us to, number one, interpret what's going on, to interpret what's being said, and to express your heart and your mind. Now, if you can't interpret well, and if you can't express well, you can imagine what a deterrent that is to the good life and the extra treasures, the extra feelings, awareness, riches, power, influence. So it's very important to have a good vocabulary. It's very important now to be able to translate it, learning to say it well. Now, this is a whole subject in itself. This is worth a weekend of study. Let me just give you a short list of suggestions on learning to say it well. Number one, repetition. It just takes practice. I don't know any substitute for the practice. 
To learn any skill, you just got to go through it again and again and again. You just do it over and over and often. Next is vocabulary. Saying it well is proper choice of words. To build my early vocabulary, I used to put three or four words I didn't know on a card, put it up on the sun visor, on my car. Back in those days, I traveled a lot by car. Sure enough, by the end of the day, I'd mastered two or three words. Vocabulary. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. One reason for vocabulary is to interpret what we see, to interpret what we hear. The vocabulary of the mind grapples with the words and the images that come to our mind. Now, if you've got a poor set of words and skills and tools with which to interpret, you can imagine the errors and the mistakes you'll make in judgment. And since vocabulary is a way of seeing, if you can't see well, you can imagine the errors you can make and how they compound as life unfolds. We do two things with vocabulary. We interpret and we express. Here's some other parts to saying it well. Sincerity, from the heart, with noble intent, wishing to bring value. That adds immeasurably to your ability to speak well, communicate well. There's no substitute for sincerity. I can forgive you for a mistake in judgment, but I can't forgive you for a mistake in intent. Next key part to saying it well, brevity. Part of the key is to be brief. You can't linger too long, I've discovered in my lecturing and speaking around the world. You can't linger too long on any one point. I used to tell stories too long, too long. I'd get involved in a long, long story on and on. By the time I hit the punchline, people forgot how it started. Now it doesn't make sense. Too long. Here's why brevity is important. The human attention span is short. You haven't got long to get it said before you lose your audience. Sometimes we try to make up in words what we lack in self-confidence. So part of the key to being brief is personal development, personal growth, personal awareness, understanding self-worth. Now you can use the economy of words. And this is a good position to be in that what you are adds so much weight to what you say that you don't have to say very much. But brevity is a good point on saying it well. Here now starts the power of what we say, intensity. Part of the strength of what we say is the words we choose. The greater part of the strength of what we say is the emotions that are loaded into the words. Here's what has power unmatched, words loaded with emotion. There is no greater power. Words have an effect, but words loaded with emotion have an incredible effect. My words may reach you, but if I can't touch you with my spirit, if I can't touch you with my emotions, my feelings, my beliefs, then I probably haven't affected you very much. The feelings, the belief, the commitment, all that I am, if I can put more of what I am into what I say, no telling what miracle I can rot. No telling how much of an effect I can be. Real persuasion comes from putting you into what you say. But now here's part of the clue, and we call these extra refinement of leadership skills. Learning to measure your emotions. That's very important to learn to measure your emotions. You don't need an atomic explosion for a minor point. Enough, but not too much. We call this understanding how to measure the flow of your emotions to cover a point. Okay, but if it needs heavyweight stuff, you reach and get it. If it needs a milder approach, you learn how to measure it in milder, easier terms. But it's very important to measure your emotions, your feelings. Now, what do we mean by intensity and emotions? Here it is. All of your experiences and how they've affected you. That's the sum total of your emotional content where you've been and what you've heard and what you've seen and who you've met and this whole panorama of life experiences for you up until now and how you felt about all that. That we call the sum total of your emotions. Now the key is to learn how to measure all that and put it in effective amounts into the words you choose. So here's the key to effective communications. Well-chosen words loaded with well-measured emotion. Next is style. And there's all kinds of parts to style from body language and gestures to facial expressions and eyes and emotion. But style is very important. Here's part of the clue. 
It's not just the matter you cover, it's the manner in which you cover the matter. Style is important to attract someone's attention, to emphasize the point. Now I've got a couple of good points here on style. Be a student of style, but don't just copy someone's style. Make sure that the study of style becomes distinctly you. But it is also important to be a student of style. How people speak well, be a student of that. And then borrowing bits and pieces from people you admire and the way they can communicate. Then make sure that all of that blended into you becomes your own distinctive style. But style is very important. Now there's a variety of styles. But it's important to study your own style and say, how am I coming across in style? Should I learn to emphasize more? Should I learn to be more emphatic? All these things concerning style. Read your audience. It's very important to read and to pick up the signals of what's happening with your audience. So let me give you some clues on reading. Simply to listen. Part of reading is listening. You pick up a lot of clues as to what else to say, what all to say by being a good listener. From early times, I think we've learned to be a good speaker. You've got to be a good listener. That's where you pick up the information, is to listen well, especially in a private conversation, a more informal conversation. Good listening habits. That's part of reading. There's a Bible phrase that says, humans cannot live on bread alone or food alone. It says the next most important thing to bread is words. Words nourish the mind. Words nourish the soul. Humans have to have food and words to be healthy and prosperous. Make sure you have a good diet of words every day. But you can change yourself. You say, well, what can I do about the upcoming winters of my life, the challenges that I know I'm going to face? Here's what you can do. You can get wiser and stronger and better. Just make a list of that trio of words. Wiser, stronger, and better. Go home smarter than you came. Go home with more ideas than you came with. Next, get stronger. You can develop the muscle. You can develop the courage muscle. You can develop the inspiration muscle. You can develop the dedication muscle. You can get stronger. There isn't anybody here that can't get stronger. Next time we see you, may not even recognize you, how strong you're going to be able to become in language, in style, in personality, the ability to cope, the ability to handle with anything that happens, no matter what happens. And the third one is get better. We can all get better. I've gotten better. First talk I gave, I stood up. My mind sat back down. But here's the secret to my success. I stood up and did it again. I stood up and I did it again. And I did it again and I did it again all those many years ago. I did it when I was scared and I did it when I didn't want to and I did it when I was ill. And I did it when it didn't work well and I didn't did it when they didn't appreciate it. And I didn't a lot of times when I didn't know much what I was doing. I just did it anyway. And now, all these years later, I'm asked to walk on this stage with the greatest introduction I've ever had, greatest response and welcome I've ever had, the greatest opportunity I've ever had to touch this many lives with a mixture of words and heart and soul. I got better. I got better day by day and week by week and month by month. And I'm asking you to do the same thing until you can develop a long arm and a long reach, until you can develop influence that won't quit. Touch people next year you couldn't touch this year. Touch people now you couldn't touch before. Conduct a meeting now you couldn't conduct before. Heart and soul now mixed in there that wasn't there, missing before. I'm asking all of you to get better in spite of the winters, in spite of the downturn, the money downturn, the social downturn, the personal downturn, whatever it is. Just get stronger. Get better. The key is not to wish for a better winter. The key is to wish for more strength, more wisdom, more courage. Get better, get wiser, get stronger. Here's number two. Learn to take advantage of the spring. Spring means opportunity. And we've got a fresh spring going here. It's called a spring like no other. A spring, an opportunity like no other for you. But here's the clue. Spring is not a guarantee of a harvest in the fall, in the autumn, harvest on. Here's what you must learn to do. Underline the two words if you're taking notes. Take advantage. Take advantage of the spring. 
Don't just be faked out by the spring because the nice weather has come. And looks like everything is going to be a lot better. The winter's finally passed. The spring is here. I'm telling you, that's not going to do it for you. Just because the spring is here, it's not going to do it for you. You've got to seize it with your own two hands and take advantage. Read the books. Study the tapes. Go back through your notes. Get ready to cash in on the spring. And now there's a sense of urgency here. Here's why. Spring doesn't last that long. Sooner let's take advantage of it. It's called take advantage of the spring. And there's also an urgency here. How many springs have you got in a lifetime? Not very many. Life is brief at the longest. The Beatles wrote, life is very short. And for John Lennon, it was extra short. For Michael Landon, it was extra short but it is short there's an urgency here don't waste your springs don't just let them pass 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 hoping the time will pass take advantage last year it was seize the moment and I'm asking you now this season to seize the spring opportunity you got a new organization going seize the spring you got a new distributor going seize the spring you've got a new life situation going seize the spring take advantage of it don't let it pass without giving it the best of your two hands and your attention. Number three, first, learn how to handle the winter. Second, take advantage of the spring. Number three, in the summer, learn to nourish and protect. We've got some major challenges now come summertime. One is to nourish our values, take care of them, feed them. Don't let them go hungry. Don't let them go wanting in nourishment and care. And then here's something else we've got to do in the summer. Defend ourselves against the enemies. Summertime is a unique time. It's a time of opportunity. It's also a time of challenge. But whatever threatens you, I'm asking you to threaten it back. Take care of your responsibility, but don't take anything off of anybody. Somebody wants to destroy your chances for a good future by their negative talk, negative thinking, putting it all down, I'm telling you, walk away if you have to, walk away. Whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Whatever threatens your opportunity, threaten it back. Now, some of our enemies are on the outside, but here's the most important thing to understand. Some of our enemies are on the inside. Let me give you a quick list. Indifference. You got to do battle with your own indifference. Boy, it's easy to coast. Especially if you've accomplished something, you know, extraordinary now. Somebody says, I gotta relax. Here's the key. Not too long. The weeds will take all you plant if you rest too long. Don't rest too long. Indecision. You gotta make those decisions. The ones that don't turn out to be good gives you experience to make better decisions. Don't let much time go by without making some decisions. The ones that you can make quickly, make them quickly. The ones that take time, take your time, but get those decisions made. Don't let indecision be an enemy, rob you of the future, empty your bank account, leave you with zero in the purse. Don't let that happen. The next one is doubt. Sure, there's doubts on the outside. People doubt that America's going to make it. People doubt that Europe's going to make it. People doubt that Russia's going to make it, that Poland's going to make it, that Czechoslovakia's going to make it. They doubt the whole world is going to make it. But I'm asking you not to pick up all those doubts. I'm asking you to have some faith, have some courage, believe, drive your doubts into a small corner. Don't let them loose like a mad dog, drive you into a small corner. Don't doubt the future. Don't doubt the possibilities. Don't doubt the extraordinary gifts that your distributors bring to your organization. Don't doubt that. And here's the most important one of all. Don't doubt yourself. And every other thing we can possibly stuff ourselves with in one eight-hour period of time. And even though we may wish we could breathe a little easier in our clothing, we have to have the desire to exercise a little more and eat a little less. The I wish I could lose weight has to become, I have the eager desire to lose weight. I'm also sure you've heard people talk about wishing they had more money to pay the bills, or take a vacation, or just to take a little pressure off of life. But before their lifestyle can change, their wish needs to become a desire. If they really desired change, 
They wouldn't spend their evenings just watching TV and wishing they were doing something more. The backbone of an eager desire to change is discipline. True ambition is disciplined, eager desire. It's that little part within us that says, if I want to be ready for that meeting tomorrow, I need to finish preparing for it today. If I want to make sure I can pay for my kid's college education, I need to start saving today. If I want a better life tomorrow, I need to start working on it today. Ambition is a minute-by-minute, day-by-day mentality. To have the ambition to work towards a better family life, a newer car, a bigger house, a financially secure future, you have to live it every moment. If living a successful life was easy, I'm sure more people would be successful. If just being ambitious was enough, I'm sure all of the broke and perplexed people in the world wouldn't be broke and perplexed. While most people spend most of their lives struggling to earn a living, a much smaller number seem to have everything going their way. Instead of just earning a living, the smaller group is busily working at building and enjoying a fortune. Everything just seems to work out for them. And here sits the much larger group, wondering in awe on how life can be so unfair, complicated, and unjust. So what's the major difference between the little group with so much and the larger group with so little? Despite all the factors that affect our lives, like the kind of parents we have, the schools we attended, the part of the country we grew up in, none has as much potential power for doing good as the ability to dream. Dreams are a projection of the kind of life we want to lead. Dreams can drive you. Dreams can make you skip over obstacles. When we allow our dreams to pull us, they unleash a creative force that can overpower everything in our way. To unleash this power, though, your dreams must be well-defined. A fuzzy future has little pull power. Well-defined dreams are not fuzzy. Wishes are fuzzy. To really achieve your dreams, to really have your future plans pull you, your dreams must be vivid. One of the issues Mr. James dealt with in his lifetime was, what does it mean to be a success, a significant person? After years of pondering this question, William James described success as a combination of two things. Number one, an inner ideal which is followed persistently with courage. And number two, outer achievement related to that ideal. Let's go back to number one, an inner ideal which is followed persistently with courage. I take that to mean defining a goal and having the resolve to complete it. No matter what, I'll do it or die. Promise yourself you'll read the books until your skills change. Go to the seminars until you get a handle on it. Do it until it makes sense. Practice it until you've got it right. Don't give up until you get where you want to be, however long that is. Step by step, piece by piece, book by book, seminar by seminar, do it until. Go for it. Until is a very important word. It's magic. It means that you'll never give up. Don't miss the chance to grow, to pay the price, until you learn change, grow. You'll discover some of life's great treasures when you pay that price. William James' second part to success dealt with the outer achievement related to that ideal. You need both aspects to really be a success. But what Dr. James realized about his philosophy of success was that the first part is indeed more important than the second. Going for it. As long as you're working toward your inner goal, your dream, then success is possible. But once you give up your inner vision, then you can never become successful. You never will become successful. Until doesn't even matter. Now, maybe the person who's been working on a project for 10 years can be successful in his own right, if he's honestly working toward it. 
doing everything to make himself worthy of reaching the dream. Really happy with where he is, doing it until. Then maybe he is a success. It's a personal thing, going for it one step at a time, going for small accomplishments along the way for however long it takes. So let's think about this for a moment. What outside evidence or results or proof can be seen when you accomplish your goals one step at a time? You'll start to see things change around you, little things, not major things, but little everyday things, things you may not even notice unless you are paying attention. If you're one of those who'd rather stay up late and get up late, only to discover that your workplace doesn't fit your schedule, and you roll out of bed cursing the alarm clock every morning, maybe you could start with the little change of going to bed half an hour earlier than normal. And maybe you'll see, in time of course, you can't train your body overnight, maybe you'll find out that you jump out of bed in a better mood, and that your day will start better, and that you'll get more done, and that the people around you that caused you problems aren't so hard to work with after all. It all starts by making one little change and adding to it every day. You see, you can't change what's going on around you without first changing what's going on within you. Start changing how you look at mornings, and sure enough, people will start changing how they look at you. When you start changing how you think, how you act, how you treat others, how you treat yourself, when you start responding instead of reacting to life, life will start responding to you. I'm telling you that you can do it with your lifestyle. You can do it with your sales career. You can do it with your management career. You can do it with any part of your life. You cannot believe what can happen in such a short period of time. So you ask yourself, what small changes can I start making today? Well, you can start in your car on your way to work. If you're sitting on the highway, stop and go traffic, moving at about 15 miles per hour tops, look at the guy or the lady sitting next to you and give them a smile, or thumbs up, or even wave. Now, some people might think you're a little strange, but hey, you'll feel better. And tomorrow, when you get into the office, how about a big cheery hello to the people at the front desk and everyone you see on the way to your office? And when you get home tonight, how about giving your wife or husband and kids big hugs instead of collapsing on the sofa? When you start with the little things that make others happy, improve their day, you'll find that these little things add up to big ones. So what happens when you start taking charge of your own personal happiness, your own life? Do you think that these little things will somehow make a difference in meeting your goals? You bet they will. You can't do it alone. You can't be successful by yourself. It's hard to find a rich hermit, you know. The ambitious person realizes that each of us needs all of us. You all by yourself may have finalized the company's marketing plan or finished up the sales projections, or even wrote the mission statement for the year to come. Even if you did this all by yourself, you really had the help of all of those around you who tolerated and supported your need to be undisturbed, or provided service to you during the project. Maybe you should thank those people every once in a while with a dinner certificate, or a bouquet of flowers. After all, without your support team, you probably wouldn't be where you are today. You can't be successful by yourself. So thank them. Thank those around you. And let them know just how important they are to you. Be it your office personnel or your family or your friends, a thank you sure goes a long way. You don't have to worry about the winds that will most certainly blow around you, the obstacles, the negativity that will stand in your way, you don't have to worry about what other people will say. You just have to keep your mind on your course. Those winds may blow fast and furious, but if you know your path, if you know where you are going, 
They will help push you toward the dreams and goals and treasures that you have already decided you're going after. Your goals will push you forward ahead of the stormy weather. There are some amazing people around that we can learn from today. People who have already braved the storms and come out on top. People who are still alive today. People who started with nothing and ended up with something great. Famous people, not so famous people. Maybe even people you know, but don't know their stories. People who had an early vision and ambition. People who turned their focused dreams into the reality of success. One of my friends tells this story about her dad. She thinks he's cheap. She gives him a hard time every time they go to one of those all-you-can-eat places because he eats all he can eat until he can't move, until he needs to take something for indigestion. But she knows where he came from, his history, and understands just why he is the way he is. He eats all he can eat because he was raised in an orphanage, a place where you had to grab all you could or you'd be hungry. But the real story behind her father is that he made himself a millionaire with nothing more than a dream. He watched his own father drown when he was four, was taken away from his mother a few years later and put into an orphanage because he was so bad. Raised by other people, strangers. After growing up in foster homes, he decided to go out on his own. He barely finished high school, but he found a job as a vacuum cleaner salesman. He did well, really well. But the woman he loved didn't want to marry a vacuum cleaner salesman, and he really didn't want to be one. So he went to college, went on to medical school, prospered, really prospered, led a tremendously successful life as a radiologist, and is now retired, goes fishing, rides his Harley. Stories of success are all around us, everywhere. Take the time to talk to these people or read their stories. You might learn something. You might find out that they have already traveled the path you are now on. Many of these people have written books on their journeys. These books tell the stories and give the secrets that we can all learn from. Let's say you decided to take a trip, just a short one, maybe for a weekend. Let's say you want to go away to a place you've never been before. Wouldn't you want to find someone who had been there? Ask them a few questions. What's the best way to get there? The safest route? The quickest route? What do I need to bring to be totally prepared? What fun things should I look for on the way? What dangers do I need to avoid? By talking with someone who has already been there, it'll make your trip that much more enjoyable. It's the same thing with life. By listening to those who are farther along in the journey, the journey you are interested in taking, and learning from their successes and failures, you just might pick up something that will make your journey that much better. Listening to the stories of others can be motivating, captivating. They can provide that extra push you've been looking for. They can demonstrate what the power of ambition is truly all about. They've been there. Their knowledge is valuable. And when you use that knowledge and motivation to take action, you'll gain momentum. Eventually, you will find that the key to motivation, true motivation, is right there inside you. You won't have to look elsewhere to get pumped up, turned on, charged up. With the right knowledge behind you, you will learn how to motivate yourself. With the right knowledge, you will find yourself becoming inspired on your own. And in order to move forward, you must be motivated, inspired, ambitious. You must have dreams and goals that create ambition, good ambition, positive ambition. Now, ambition does not mean being greedy. It does not mean being selfish. It does not mean getting ahead at the expense of others. Ambition is not greed. Ambition is not avarice and all-consuming desire for wealth. Ambition is not hoping you can win at the expense of others. 
Do you suppose Judas was ambitious? He ended up with 30 pieces of silver, a fortune in those days. Was Judas successful because he had all that money? No, Judas sold out. Was Judas happy when it was all over with? No, the money didn't make him happy. What he did to get the money certainly didn't make him happy. What Judas became in the pursuit of his fortune caused him to end his own life. What drove him was not ambition. Ambition is not greed. Ambition is an eager desire to achieve, an eager desire to get ahead in life, to do more for your family, to prosper in health, wealth, and relationships. Now, desire does not always translate into ambition. Desire is what you want for yourself, a bigger house, a better car, a fatter bank account, a better life. I desire to have these things. Ambition is how you get there. Desire is sometimes healthy. Desire is sometimes unhealthy. Desire might say, I want the tallest building in town. The destructive side of desire might urge you to tear all of the other buildings down. I guess that's one way to do it. You might get away with tearing down the first one and maybe the second one. But in your desire to tear them all down, sooner or later, some guy is going to be standing out in front of his building saying, I'm on to you. Get out of here. And pretty soon you're no longer known as a builder. You're known as a destroyer. Now, the second way to have the tallest building in town is to see it, dream it, and plan it, and put your team on it, work on it. Go through all of the steps to get there. Do it right. Have the ambition to be the owner of the tallest building in town, and go through all of the right steps to get there. If you really want it and have the skills to do it and the patience to weather all of the storms, your ambition will lead you there. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. Now, it takes time to bring value to the marketplace. However, we do not get paid for time. So we cross that out. Mistakenly, the man says, I'm making about $20 for an hour. Not true. If that was true, you could just stay home, right? And have them send your money. So that's not true. We don't get paid for time. We get paid for value brought to the marketplace. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of my talk to you today. Is it possible to become twice as valuable to the marketplace and make twice as much money in the same time? Is that possible? The answer is yes. Could you become three times as valuable as you might be right now to the marketplace and make three times as much money? In the same time, and the answer is yes. Five times, 10 times, of course. America is unique, it's a ladder to climb. It starts down here, let's say at $5 an hour, and it keeps going up. Top income last year, $80 million. The guy who runs Coca-Cola. Now, that's a heck of a ladder, that's why everybody wants to come here, right? The boat people are not headed for Vietnam. Uh, people haven't plotted and schemed for 50 years saying if I could just get to Poland, everything would be okay. Not true. Everybody wants to come to America. And the reason is because we've got the best wind ever blowing in our favor. We've got the best economic opportunity anybody's had in six and a half thousand years. And all you have to do is understand it and take advantage of it. Now, there's some key questions to ask here. Why would the marketplace pay someone only $5 an hour? Very simple answer. They're not very valuable to the marketplace. Now, we must underline to the marketplace. This person might be a very valuable brother. Yes. Member of the family, valuable. Yes. Valuable member of the church, of course. Valuable citizen of the country. Yes. Valuable in the sight of God, no doubt. We're all of equal value in the sight of God. But if you're not very valuable to the marketplace, you don't get much money. You say, well, it shouldn't be that way. Well, then you've got to start your own country. You know, this one's been in process for 200 years, and this is the best we've been able to come up with so far. But here's the key. You don't have to stay here. 
Now, there was a big debate in Congress last year that this $5 was not enough, should be six, should be six, should be six, but we don't need legislation. Six is already on this ladder, the next step up. You know, if you work for McDonald's, they'll pay you $5 an hour to take out the trash. If you whistle while you take out the trash, they'll pay you $6 an hour. So we don't need that legislation. You need, just need to take lessons on how to whistle. Have a good attitude. Now, as you begin to climb this ladder, why would the marketplace pay some people $50 an hour? Answer, evidently, they must be more valuable to the marketplace. Ten times more valuable. And is that possible for someone to be 10 times more valuable and earn $50 an hour instead of five? And the answer is yes. That's what America is all about. Now, why would the marketplace pay some people $500 an hour? Evidently, this person must be much more valuable to the marketplace. That's what's important to understand to the marketplace. And would the marketplace pay one person $80 million for one year's work? And the answer is, of course. If you helped a company make a billion dollars, would they pay you $80 million? I'm telling you, it is possible. And that's why America is so exciting. That's why this financial ladder is so exciting. It's possible for all of this to come true for all of you, no matter where you start. As a student in school, just getting started out there in the workplace, this is all possible for you. Now, Mr. Schoff gave me the clue on how to climb this ladder as high as I wanted to climb. Now, we're talking primarily economics here. There's a lot of other ways to become valuable to your family, valuable to your friends, valuable to the community, valuable to the team, right? Valuable to the, to the uh, team effort, valuable to the concert. But here's what he said to me. In climbing this ladder economically, all you have to do is work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I heard that, it made sense to me. I kept hoping that everything else would change around me, found out that if I went to work on myself, worked on my skills, worked on my language, if I became better than I was each year, if I grew in skills and language and vocabulary, and competence, then I would become attractive to the marketplace. Not very long ago, a company called me and said, Mr. Owen, we're expanding internationally. We'd like to have a bit of your expertise to help us. Uh, would you give us a bit of your time? We'll add some millions to your fortune. And I said, okay. And I thought later, isn't that interesting? They would call me. Then my second thought was, of course they'd call me. Who else would they call? I can get the job done. Now, what a contrast for me, farm boy from Idaho, raised in obscurity, parents of modest means, broke when I was 25. How come I would get a telephone call and someone offer me a lot of money to help them in expanding around the world? Simple answer, evidently, something happened to me between age 25 and where I am today. And I can tell you where it all started. From my teacher, Mr. Shoaff, who said to me, we don't have to change what's going on out there. That's the wind that's blowing. All we have to do is change what's going on in here. And now there's several ways to do that on personal development. And let me give you those ways. Here's the first one. We must learn from personal experience. Pretty simple. Learn from what happens to you. Take a look back over the last few months. Did you make some mistakes? How could you correct those for the future? Take a look back over the last year. Have you done it right or done it wrong? Let's correct it for the next year. Learn from your personal experience. Mr. Schoff asked me when I first met him, he said, Mr. Owen, how are you doing? You've been out there now six years. And I said, I'm not doing very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. What a simple, swift analysis to my situation. He said, if you keep doing it, the next six years will be like the last six. You don't want that to happen. Let's make the changes. So learn from your personal experience. Now here's number two, why I came to share this video experience with you today. And that, I call it OPE, other people's experiences. That's me, other people. That's your teacher, other people. That's your friends and colleagues, other people. The people you meet that can pass along to you their experiences, 
what's happened to them, the mistakes they made, how they corrected them, how they changed their health and changed their bank account and changed their income and changed their future. That's it. Other people. Now, there's two kinds of people to learn from. One is failures. It's too bad failures don't give seminars, right? That would be valuable. Bring your notebook. Have them tell you how they lost it all and threw it all away, threw their health away and threw their friendships away and things didn't work out well. That would be valuable. But now then we must also learn from positive people that have done well. They've got the health and so we ask them, how did you become so healthy? They've got the skills, so we ask them, how did you become this skillful? They've got the income, so we ask them, how did you get here in such a short period of time? So now here's what's important in personal development. In learning from other people, we learn, number one, by observation. We learn what we see. We watch people that are successful in what they do. In sports, we watch their disciplines. In business, we watch their disciplines by observation, what we can see. The reason I created this video is something that you could see someone's experiences translated for you. Second, we learn by what we hear. I've got some of my uh, lectures on cassette tapes, so you know, you can take them with you wherever you go and learn by listening. Turn your car into a mobile classroom and listen. And then listen to the sermon on Sunday morning. Listen to the lectures. Listen to the teacher. Listen to someone who's got something good to say. And then number three is vitally important on personal development, and that is read all the books all the books you can possibly read in your lifetime. Mr. Schof got me started on my library. I've got one of the better libraries. Haven't read everything in it, but I feel smarter just walking in it, my library. At least I was smart enough to buy it. Now I gotta be smart enough to read it. And then of course I gotta be smart enough to decide what's valuable and then do it. But this one is very important, become a good reader. Some books that helped change my life. Mr. Schof recommended, of course, the Bible. And my parents made sure I was a pretty good scholar by the time I was 18. That's been so beneficial for me, drawing from those illustrations, uh, reading about those stories, people who made it and people who didn't make it and what the difference was. And then other books that helped to really change my life. One called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And then a book that helped me become financially independent by the time I was 31. And that book is called The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson. And I'm going to share a little bit of that book with you when I get to financial independence today, our third subject. But I started reading the books, attending the classes, uh, making sure that I got in front of people that had something good to say. And then I started keeping a journal. One of the major things my teacher taught me was to keep a journal. He said, don't trust your memory. If you hear something good, just make a little note and write it down. Now, at first, I took, you know, notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes, and it didn't serve me well, you know, thrown in a drawer. Then I learned to keep a journal, a bound copy of all my notes. So I would suggest you do the same. Things that impress you, a poem that impresses you. Uh, when you attend a class, some of the ideas that impressed you, jot them down. Uh, you read something in a magazine, right? Some ideas. Take those out, put them in your journal. Keep a good journal. The rest of your life, this will serve you well. My journals make up a significant portion of my own library. And if you saw my library and saw my journals, I'd tell you what you'd have to say. This is the library, and these are the journals of a very serious student. No wonder Mr. Rohn is invited to lecture and speak on his experiences around the world. So I want the same thing to happen to you. Value captured that you can resort to later, go back over it and review it, and let it become valuable to you. So that's my first subject, personal development. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Develop the skills, learn the lessons, take the classes, uh, absorb all that is being taught to you these days. And then later on, of course, you can sort it out, what's valuable to you and how to refine it for your business and for your life and for your future. But the main thing is to get it and start this process of personal change, personal development. And let me say it one more time. If you will change, everything will change for you. You'll never be the same. You'll keep growing. As you look back on a few months, look back on a few years, you won't believe the progress you can make economically, your relationship with your family, your friends, 
And whether you're in sports or economics or whatever, I'm telling you, that whole process of committing yourself for personal change, personal value, can really make your life unique and worthwhile.